arrangement where they would have a standard contract, Actors Theater, and you know, and then, then they would arrange that with the playwright. And, and uh, I, there were some plays that I knew about that I wanted in, in the book, and I, I wanted one by Mr. Jory. And for basically, I said to jo John and Michael, just you know, pick the ones you love the most. And um, the one that John mentioned yesterday, someone asked, what was your book, my favorite? And it was a play by Mark O'Donnell called Bar Bliss. And I'm pretty certain that that's in that book. And so we published a, I don't know, 20, I love that, uh, a collection of 25, 10 minute plays. And it just took off. <coughs> and we did so well that a couple years later we did another one. And now Sang the French is up to something like six, you know. And now there are 10 minute play festivals and productions all over the world. You know, there's, I mean, there's an organization out of Australia that's called Short Plus Sweet, and they, they, they produce festivals in countries in that part of the world, you know, They're all over. I, did, I had a, a playwright who I've been helping with a little bit, and she sent a play out there, and it was done, but Short and Sweet picked it, and it was done at their Malaysia festival, and won an award for the best of the festival, you know. So, you know, you, your work can get done all over the world. So, uh, so we, so, so this just exploded. So, um, uh, Smith and Krauss, uh, well, I'll get that. With Samuel Francis, I was able to get a lot of, lot of plays published by playwrights that sub subsequently became pretty famous, you know. And I had two varying degrees was instrumental in getting Samuel French to publish it, including Jay Martin, but, you know, Tina Howell, Don Nigro, and lots of these. And, uh, and then uh, it, you know, I, I started editing my books for Smith and Cross, and I did their line, annual monologue books. And they, did a, they did an anthology of new plays by women, which they don't do anymore. It pisses me off. Well, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then it's, uh, also you produce a Boston <laughs> Theater Marathon. Yeah, I don't, I'm not involved in that, though. Yeah. That's the, you see, Smith and Cross is basically all freelancers. Okay. You know, it's, there's, it's not, it's, you know, they, uh, a man and a woman, they, Marisa Smith and Eric Krauss run it out of their home in New Hampshire, and they hire various people to do various projects. And um, uh, for about three or four years, they published like all of the Boston Marathon Theater Marathon plays. And uh, so, so uh, then uh, they, they they were publishing an anthology of ten-minute plays annually that Michael Dixon was editing. And then I don't know why, but they asked me to do it. I don't know. So I said okay. So I started. Originally, it was there would be two books. One was plays for two two actors, and one was plays for three or more actors. And I did. I, and then about two or three years ago, they said, "Dolls put them all together in one book." And I said, "That's a big long book." And they said, "That's okay." You know. So so uh, so now that I've bought the last three years, but what I've done for the last two years, I want you to know, is that I've been collecting uh, a list of all the people in the world that do 10 minute plays. <laughs> and with contact information and everything, you know, the hoo ha festival, the yada yada, you know, and so for the last two years, every, every, the book that I have in the back, there's a list of all of them. So that, you know, when you get that book and you can, you can put it, make your own database for submissions. And you know, probably some of them are, don't do it anymore. But you know, I, I try to update it as much as I can. So every year, so the most up to date one is the new book, which just came out, in 2014. And is it available in that book? I don't. I hope so. They have some. <laughs> they, they have. They sent some down, down. But you know, I don't know. Maybe everyone's bought it. <laughs> but you can you can get it online or call them up and uh, and they didn't send my new playwrights book, which pissed me. The new one. You know, I don't know why, they do it. but you know what they also have in there that I highly recommend is their most recent publication. I call them they because I really don't work. I'm a freelancer. You know, I work for them and applause. Is the most recent hot off the press title is by Michael Bigelow Dixon, who you'll meet. And, He's right and, here. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and it's, he'll he'll probably tell you about it, but it's it's my opinion 
it, I mean, it's a brilliant, brilliant book. I disagree with a lot of it, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but it's, it is, in my opinion, could become as influential a book uh, as, like, the theater in its double or the empty space. It's, it's, a, it's, it's the manifesto of what I call a burgeoning anything but realism movement. Yeah. <laughs> and it talks about why, you know, and it's, it's very, very persuasive, and I highly recommend that book. Great. Yeah, so that's me. Great, thank you so much. Um, so, yes. Next, I want to go to, to Linda Padgett from uh, 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 Dramatic Publishing. Uh, and what's interesting about, about everyone here and these publishers is that there's some things that are shared and there's some sort of things that are different. And so I want to talk about that. And one of the things that I'm very impressed with, uh, what's happening with you, is that the kind of thematic collections that you're doing, the editorial decisions, and in some ways it's kind of a producerial thing that's happening with several of these publishers, which is really interesting in terms of that kind of imagination to put things together. So, uh, yeah. Well, most of our Tim and Price collections have been commissioned. Um, the most recent one is The Bully Price, which I commissioned, and we asked 22 of our current authors to write Tim and Price about around the theme of bullying, and didn't expect all 22 to um, agree, but they all did, so it's also a big public collection. And uh, we have, we have um, authors like Susan Gregg, Cecilia Gregory, um, Richard Dresser, Jose Cruz Gonzalez, really wanted to play and it really took off. It um, sells tons of copies of this in their offices and collections and because they're 22 they can be done in different ways and it's a multitude of so this is this is good. So it's 10 by 10, 10 short plays and critiques about ethics and values, also commissioned from um, stage. 
20 some of his plays in there. I'm talking to a <laughs> book like that. Every time I bring it to a conference and I tell people what the overall price for all the books are, they always pick that one up and go, this one too, <laughs> assuming that it's like twice as much. Um, Shel Silverstein, we have a lot of really dark and absurd uh, pieces by him. Um, you know, yes, John Patrick Shanley, we have a collection of short ones by him. This just came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, everybody always seems to express surprise when Wendy Wasserstein, we have a collection of seven short plays of hers. Um, and uh, yes, my, one of my own, Life is Short. Um, one of my, going back to what you're saying about <coughs> plays being done all over the world, one of my short plays, which is actually published by Play Scripts, um, <laughs> is, my, is my single most produced play. It's been translated into about five languages. Uh, a, a Greek theater company in Athens stole it and ran it for three months. <laughs> um, it was recently stolen in Zimbabwe as well. Yeah. So, we'll talk about stealing well, the <laughs> uh, And um, I, uh, you know, also we started getting into most of our collections, obviously, as I've kind of shown, are by single authors, because you, you tend to get a single collection, unless you commission something like that, or if you put out a <coughs> call. Um, but I you know, knew that a lot of our authors were maybe writing a one-off, you know, like they did the 24-hour plays or some other contest. So I started um, uh, editing for us um, a collection just called Outstanding Short Plays, where I would get about 10 of them. And this was the first volume which came out a couple of years ago. I've edited the second volume, which will be out later this year. Um, so it's just a way, you know, to, to work with our authors when they don't have six, seven, eight, nine, ten of them. Um, you know, but, you know, the, big, the biggest and latest, I think, of the ten-minute things is Almost Maine, which some people may not think of as, as a, a ten-minute place, but actually, you know, it's a series of, of them. Strung together in a lovely way, and this has been, I think, one of the most produced plays <laughs> yep. in in North America. The last three years alone, we've had over 500 productions a year. Of they just did a revival in New York. Yeah, and they just did a revival in New York, which John Carriani uh, was acting in. Um, and I mean, this is a real Cinderella story because it was done in New York. You know, it ran for a month or so. It closed. It didn't make much uh, news or headway. And slowly, people started discovering it, word of mouth got out there, and slowly we were licensing it constantly. And I then, put it in my new playwrights book, yeah. and scenes from it, and, and I think that's one of the ways they heard about it. Yeah, I'm sure it is, I'm sure it is. And suddenly, every school, college, community theater, you know, who knows, <laughs> people by the side of the road started. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and it's a lot of it. And it's been a huge, huge uh, success, obviously. And it shows what you can you can do with the 10 minute play form. You can put them all together. My two of my first two full length plays, if you look at them, are you know, they have an overall kind of story and arc and, and character and everything, but I wrote them in, in short segments.
guys, we actually, about, I'd say about 20% of our open submissions, we also have an open and plays that are under 20 minutes. Um, and then a, another probably 40% are plays that are one acts for high school competition, which is something that play scripts really, um, that's how the company was built and it's something we're really passionate about. Um, and we also have plays for the um, professional market as well. So we're cross market, but I would say that short plays are really big for us. Um, we have 10 volumes of great short comedies and dramas and we define short as anything under like 20, 50, ish minutes, but a lot of those plays are 10-minute plays. Um, so what we do is, if you send us a 10-minute play, and we love it, we say to you, hey, we love this, we'd like to make a publication offer. We don't know when our next collection is coming out, but when it comes out, you'll be in it. And so sometimes that, we usually do about one a year, it's not like super regimented that way, but so potentially we could say, we want to put this in the next collection, and it might be up to a year before it actually hits the stands. But that's kind of how we curate the collection. And then sometimes we'll end up sort of splitting them off into different genres, like this one's the comedies and dramas. And so we have a fair amount of collections for short plays, and they do really, really well. I mean, some of them, some of our authors that have full-length plays, their 10-minute play actually does better for them. We just have real reach in that market, and um, community theaters love to do them for benefits because they can involve so many different people, and you can have, you know, like, the middle-aged couple who's the star in all the community theater plays can be in this one, and then the young people who are just kind of getting involved with the group can be in this one, and it really allows communities to, you know, make things flexible for themselves and involve a lot of people, or it also allows professional companies to use two actors or three actors over and over. So it works for lots of groups, which is, I, I think, why um, it's such a popular form. Um, so we, we have that. We have plays that come in through the transom, as we say. Um, but we also then, like, for example, we have um, a, a group of Adam Simkowitz, who's a great writer based in, uh, well, Connecticut now, um, sent us a group of plays that are all around the theme of love. And so we're publishing those. So it's, it comes either way, but I would say for us, mostly, it's us cherry-picking ones that we're excited about and putting into collections. We also um, pretend this is a book with like, a really fancy cover that says Naked Angels on it. Um, so we have a, we have a collection of... Um, 10 Minute Plays by Naked Angels, which hopefully will be here later today. Um, we also have a collection called 24 by 24, so it's 24 short plays by 24 writers that are all 10 minutes, and they're great writers. Um, so those hopefully will be here later today as well. So that's, it's something we're really excited about, it's something that we've seen a lot of success in, and something that um, we feel like is really appropriate for cross markets, and I think that's why it does so well. Thank you so much.
Poly, which is probably why I'll be like, man, if I'm <laughs> um, But yeah, so we're going into year 40. Um, I've never done this research, but Samuel French likes to say it's the oldest continuous short play festival in the country. Really yeah, that we've not ever had a year off. Um, it's gone through lots of different incarnations, so we've outsourced it, and, and now it's finally, after six years, we've taken it in-house. So the whole competition, actually Casey and I are the co-artistic directors this year, um, and all of our staff who's licensing the plays by day, we strong our the we, we make them volunteer at night and they help implement the festival and we host all these great playwrights. Um, but it's it's a this year we had 1,400 submissions and it's 30 plays that will be going up for a week. And then the result of that is that six of the plays get published and licensed. And these collections do really well, so they kind of look like this. Um, but a bunch of them in the back. Uh, and that's that's very interesting too because we've actually um, you know we we choose the six play with the help of a lot of industry colleagues and professional playwrights. So it's not just Samuel French making these decisions. It's actually like kind of a collective hive mind from the industry. And uh, what often succeeds is the non-realistic stuff, which I think it was very interesting to hear John um, champion for those plays that maybe take more risks or the short plays that are kind of adventurous or have unanswered questions at the end. Or um, So it, it's very exciting. I like, the short play festival is my favorite time of year because we get to see some really crazy stuff on stage and kind of get out of that commercial like, oh, will this sell or, how, you know, who's interested? And really see playwrights kind of in their rawest, like, let's just throw it up there and see if it works form. Um, and we've gotten some, I think, the most exciting writing um, coming through that festival, so it's very exciting. And we've also forged some really great relationships. I don't think Steve was in the room, which is fine because I skipped. You have several of Steve. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we do. Uh, we, yeah, this is it. And Steve is um, also similar to almost Maine. Um, I would encourage you to check out his short play collections because he does this interesting thing with his shorts, where he kind of weaves them together to tell a, a larger story or a larger, even like aesthetic story. Um, so he has a very like certain style in a lot of the plays, and when they're together on stage, it kind of creates this ambiance to the evening. Um, we also have talked, um, you know, I think the political idea is very exciting too, or like having a daily news kind of approach to plays, because it seems like there's a large trend right now with um, the theater breaking through barriers, just doing plays for people with disabilities, and we're seeing, um, you know, short plays about wars, and short plays about, so as a writer, like, getting things together, like we do publish a lot of collections by one writer, but even going further than that, it seems like we publish a lot of collections by one writer with a theme. <laughs> so like Tina Howe, for example, I brought last year, I brought her a um, place for women. She wrote this like, it's called Towering Tiger Lilies, and, and that's a great collection where it's, it's very, so it's like a water aerobics play where people are lactating in the pool and <laughs> nursing mothers. I mean, it's so adventurous and exciting. So I would, yeah, I mean, so as a writer, yeah, I think, um, you know, yeah, finding a way to kind of curate your own material so that it really makes sense for a theater um, to put it up is kind of an exciting notion. And, and uh, you yeah, know, there's lots of fun things you can do with that. So. Yes, we yeah. have standing on ceremony. And is that something you commissioned, or is that such a No, story? they were they were being done. I think okay. a lot of them. I was in uh, reaction to the Proposition Eight in right. California, um, and uh, there were actually a lot more. I think to begin with, um, but we contacted them and they sent us what they thought. Oh, it was done off Broadway. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, it started in, in L.A. And, then it, and, then <laughs> and also Motherhood Out Loud, which is the same, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, Mother Heard Out Loud is more along the lines of the uh, love loss and what I wore, or, oh, you know, yeah. or even a kinder, gender version of the giant. <laughs> but again, it's like, it's a bunch of different writers coming together to do yeah. things yeah. around the theme. Yeah. 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 And then did a mad job, probably too. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting question because it also leads into the whole idea of like what you look for, how you get something published, you know, what's the best way an open system what submission policy is for each yeah. of you. Is it a good idea for a writer? Like, the thematic thing is very fascinating for me because the kind of editorial and almost professorial, uh, you know, imagination that enters into that. Is it something that if someone has a couple of plays on the team, maybe they find even, you know, take the initiative to find writers they know and submit, you know, and suggest? So 
I'm curious in terms of like, what do you look for, you know, if people have 10 minute advice, what's good advice? Does someone want to leave on that? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I can, yeah, I mean, I think the <coughs> practical side of me, that's like other than the curatorial, like yeah. just make sure, you know, whatever thematic evenings you're putting together, I, I think what Larry said about negotiating for 25 different contracts can be very overwhelming and very difficult in some cases, especially if um, writers aren't willing to take a favored nations agreement. Yeah. So if you're, and, and I'm sure favored nations agreements will get covered in yes, we'll Susan's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, later. But um, yeah, I, uh, you know, making sure all the legalese is in place, if you're getting together a group of friends and you're like, hey, let's write plays about Obama, um, um, you know, make sure that that the you're really looking long term, so that there's a vision of publication down the road, and you kind of counted for that in your early discussions about where this is going. I think that's really important. Um, I mean, I've been approached recently about several collections, and it's difficult because they, there hasn't been that forethought, and then you know there's multiple agents involved, and there's um, you know writers have different expectations and and loyalties of publishers, so it gets it gets a little complicated. Um, yeah, so I'd say there, there's that, but also I think, uh, you know, French is not unsolicited anymore. We think we have a query process, and so we review 10 page samples and kind of project ideas before asking oh, to see. Oh, thank see. God. <laughs> 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 yeah, so we ask to see, you know, and we also ask for like a history of production. Um, I think we have a very, um, at least, I kind of have a philosophy that things need to be stage tested, that playwriting is as much a performance craft as it is a literary craft on the page. Um, does level of production uh, factor in? And that's okay. It depends on the market. Yeah. So I, I will say if you're writing plays and you know they're for high schools, um, and if you have a track record of, you know, okay, we've done this out of high school, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to have five off off Broadway or off Broadway production or whatever. But it needs to be. You know, you've tested it within its own audience, and there's some um, evidence that it works with that audience. So that you know, the people are contacting you about it. It got great reviews. It was extended. It sold crazy amounts of tickets. And everybody, you know, um, you're like, oh my god, I'm getting so many licensing requests. I can't even deal with it. So yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what we call it. Like <laughs> Two thousand people liked it on Facebook. Yeah, actually, social media well, recently, yeah. we've been, um, I have to say, especially for some of the larger shows, it's like knowing that, um, I will say, I always say this to the rates, but I do Google everyone that submits, um, because I want to see, like, oh, you know, reviews, and so, it's, yeah, it's helpful that like, having a web page, okay, well, I can go back and see, like, if they won awards, like, do they have relationships with theaters in place, like, if we pick this up, and, you know, we need to, we have a marketing team, we have a great marketing team at French, so, you know, and a really proactive licensing team, so we want to call the theaters you have relationships with and say, like, hey, did you know they have a short play collection? You know, or do you have a place for that in your season? So, so really, um, yeah, it, it does, as much as it is a play, is a play a good play, is it a successful play within its own parameters, you know, are you, have you thought about your career as a playwright, and are you successful? Which is a weird thing to say. Yeah, in the agency know. world, we say, is there a motor? <coughs> but you yeah, have a different view. Well, no, I mean, we've got a similar yeah. uh, submission policy. I mean, the question that I get asked all the time is, you know, can you take uh, new plays, un unproduced plays? Um, and I say, well, you know, if you go through the submission process, you know, we'll certainly take a look at them. But I, I try to dissuade them from just, you know, finish it hit print or hit send and, and get it to us. Um, because we're, we're the final stop yep. for your play. We're the, we're the last thing. If you just send it to us straight away and, and we love it and publish it, it's probably going to vanish. Um, because there are so many In certain plays. markets, yeah. Well, well, yeah. Wait, but even, even so, it's very hard yeah. because, uh, you know, there's so many, there's so many plays fighting for so many slots, and everybody is really looking for, you know, well, what was big in New York? What was big in Chicago? What are they doing, you know, in Seattle or Los Angeles? So that they tend to go to, you know, schools will go to a lot of the old favorites. Um, schools will go to what is, you know, brand new that they think they should do. So if, you know, your play can kind of get missed in, in all of that shuffle. 
And so it's incumbent on, on the writer and to kind of push that boulder of their play as far along and up the hill as they can on their own to get it to the point where it gets some kind of visibility. Uh, it doesn't have to be a New York production or anything like that, but to, to get it on, to give it a production history so that it's not just like you have to read it to, to find out how, how great it is. It helps if you've had some kind of like presence that is built. Well, to piggyback to you after that, um, and I, won't, I don't want to dominate for a long time. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but I also want to say the other thing about Tate Publishing being a final stop on the, the new play train is that uh, you, you, when it's published, there's a document that's out there for the community at large that's a testament to that. That is the writing. So it becomes very difficult to change plays once they're published. Um, and so I think also to publish with licensing agents, it's a nightmare. We've had authors with very successful large plays that all of a sudden they're like, oh, well, you know, I, I want an intermission, or I'm going to change the ending, I never like the scene. But then there's all of a sudden there's two different versions of the play that are out on the market. And if you don't want that early version performed, it's very hard to oh, please. Yeah. And, 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 you know? and sometimes it's if, if the writer is suddenly like, yes, now this is the definitive version, go out there and find the 40,000 copies of my old play them. and take them back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or they get really surprised when that old version is produced yeah. somewhere. Like, how could this happen? Like, it's been 20 there. years. <laughs> well, I'm trying to explain to you in theater, you know, why they'll be like, but you printed this, and you're like, yeah, but it's not, you know, you have to do it the way the writer wants. Or they'll be like, I like the film version. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the other couple of writers, it's like every, every day they got out and wrote their play. And one of them was David Ray, who kept doing it all the way There must have been eight different versions in the boom, boom, room. And the all-time worst of my life was Robert he wanted us to, you know, uh, not to sell our edition. We had 2,000 copies. Anybody that wanted to play, would, uh, he wanted them to, us to send them his new version. And we're going, Robert, what are we going to do with these 2,000 copies? And so he finally got so annoyed that he just sold all his copyrights to Samuel French. Yeah. So now Samuel French owns the copyrights to Kennedy Jones. Yeah. But yeah, if there's any inkling that the script was not done, I mean, I think. Play with it until you feel like okay, I've exhausted it. I don't, I don't care if it gets the bad high school production where there are uh, there. It will. You know, and it will get the bad place. That's a testament that you've made it. If it gets the bad place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I also, on, on an artistic level, yeah. like just like on an artistic level, uh, I'm look, I'm I'm a writer, and almost everyone on staff at Play Scripts is also a writer. So we're a little bit wary. Like, why would you send your play out in the world if you haven't heard it in a production? We all know how valuable that is, and so it makes us a little bit like, does this person really understand this craft if they feel like they can jump to publication without hearing it out loud? That's really different for the amateur market. We'll, we're more likely to not feel that way for a high school play because a lot of people don't have access to a high school production or something. Or we have writers who write for the high school market and know it so well that they don't need to hear it with high school students. We, we trust them and they have a brand. And, but generally, in the professional market, we're a little, we're always a little wary if you send it and you haven't had a production, just because we know that means that you didn't feel like you needed to see it on stage before you were ready, and that's, if you're like that, God bless you, but <laughs> most playwrights well, really are. Well, there is one that Samuel French publishes that is that one. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, of course there's exceptions. And he's one of the greatest geniuses writing in the American theater. And, and hopefully all of you are. And everything, <laughs> everything that he writes, uh, when he sends me, or he still sends me, but it's absolutely perfect and ready to go. It does not need any development, you know. And thank God, Samuel French, can, and now you're putting his, the ones you haven't gotten on the public yet, they're, they're on the website digitally, and he can play, he just all over the world, and plays it, you know. Who is but, Don uh, Iger. Uh, but I would say Don is an exception to the rule. But very much an yeah, exception. Yeah, very much an exception. Uh, but I will say too, like on the uh, sorry, I can't yeah. um, <laughs> the market too, like sometimes you do know. Like I think with the bullying collection, when you guys released that, I was like, oh, that's so genius. Yeah, it I was like, like that's a good idea. Because <laughs> <laughs> every high school, I feel like was calling us, calling us, oh, do you have plays about bullying? Do you have yeah. plays about? We also get like vampires. When Twilight was out, people would be like, well, do you got 
funny thing about those are, those are cutting <laughs> off into the. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. But, but the case where there are these Zombies. kind of trends that flare up, and there's a need in the, the industry, I feel like. Yeah, can I just interject something on that? Yeah. Because um, I suppose with two minutes, we're figuring out how to put it out there. Uh, not only just the festival, but also the school tours. We do a middle school tour over the course of the year, and I think this year it was like 40,000 kids saw short plays. And this collection included, or maybe last year's collection, included two pieces from the bully plays. And one thing I would tell all of you out there is if you, um, one of the things to think about is, especially for schools, if you're getting funding from grants or from school communities, they want thematic, they want, they want Ricky, you know that, a connection to, to a theme. So yeah. bullying is huge. So we went to Linda's collection and suddenly went, oh, this is really wonderful. So we found plays within that collection. But the other thing that happened in, uh, is that one of the young ladies you might have seen last night on the on stage, the, the willowy one, um, Mary Sansone became so captivated as a young actor working the school tour, she's now one of our playwrights who is writing for the tour. And I'm going to be sending you her plays because they're terrific. And she, she's two minutes out of that age group and we can relate and looks like she does, she's 26, who would know? But um, I, would, I will tell you that those, that's a, that was a brilliant idea and I'm, I'm hoping it's really successful out it there. It is very successful, so much so that I'm working on a new one. And you know how I always said before that we use the commission plays that are thematic and that we haven't really looked at timid plays? That's changed. We accept unsolicited manuscripts, we get about 500 a year. Um, usually they're one acts or full lengths, but we started to like take a much closer look at 10 minute plays and um, like you do, if we take the ones we, we like and we keep them until we have something that follows some kind of theme um, and, and then we plan to go ahead and publish collections based upon that theme. And one of the um, collections I'm collecting for right now are, are more it won't be called Bully Plays 2 or Bully Plays, more Bully Plays, or it'd be something similar though. Bully will definitely be in the title. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. It's still a resonant topic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like, any unfortunate resonant topic is probably something to think about dealing with, you know. Um, I want to open it up for questions. Uh, there was one that came from over here. Can I add one time? Yes, thing? please. I want to say on the on the nature of thieves and that kind of thing. If you have a publisher, if you already are like published with one of us, or you know, ask us. Like, say, I'm thinking of writing some yeah. ten minute plays. What is there a market for? I would have okay. said bully plays. So, you know, we're we're looking for stuff. If you know you're thinking of writing something, feel free to ask us because we're very aware of what people are asking for, what yeah. teachers are asking. Um, so one question that came here is in terms of like you license all the plays. Do you do any trade publications that are just anthologies, or do you license everything? That's the question for all. Um, like French has like French has. We're old. We're old. <laughs> um, so we've done everything historically. Like there was a time where we were doing trade, um, and I'm actually working on for the OOB 40th anniversary next year. To hope all of you fly to New York is going to be the best party for short plays. <laughs> We're already planning it. We've been planning it for like two years. Um, so I, I am putting together a, a trade more a trade book of winners from that festival. So Teresa Reback actually got her feet wet in the short play festival. Shirley Laro. I got a story about those two options. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it's, 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 that will be more like a trade and we'll probably bend it through the trade channel. Um, the differences between acting editions and trade editions, which maybe we'll get in on a later panel, but if you guys do the one-on-ones, um, we can probably explain further. But our acting editions are designed to go with licenses, so if someone is calling us for, to get a license of the show. This is an acting edition, just that like this regular thing that doesn't have yeah, a list. And this is yeah, too, yeah. but it's, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. It doesn't it's just have photographs on the cover and fancy things. Yeah. It's just very well, well, sometimes it's not. Well, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's not. Whereas Smith and Carl's only publishes trade editions. They're, they're more expensive. They're snazzier covers. And 
and warm um, on people's bookshelves. And yeah, and, yeah, and they're taught in, they, they have different distribution mm -hmm. channels. Yeah, like colleges, of course, adoption, bookstores, yeah. Um, so it helps to know that difference, and, and most um, agreements with publishers are not exclusive in terms of trade and acting. So, uh, like, for example, Larry can publish something in Best Short Plays, and then the, uh, the author can send it to us for OOB, and, you know, it, it can be in multiple collections. Yeah, because Smith & Cross doesn't do any licensing, and they don't ask for exclusives. So they could then have it published by Dramatic Public or anybody and have them license it. And, that, and we love that. Like, Year of the Rooster is getting printed in one of your books, and we're licensing it. Yeah. So if someone yeah. encounters it this way, they're just going to come to us. So it's a happy, friendly yeah. Almost. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah, there's a nice symbiotic relationship between great and, and that's and licensing. Yeah, TCG as well, who, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, TCG, most of our uh, larger plays are published in trade editions that are gorgeous, and we have a great working relationship, and yeah. yeah. And both are good, because it gets it out there, you know? There yeah. are copies it available it in marketplaces. It's more revenue books. for the writer, ultimately, yeah. depending on what agreement they have with the trade publisher, but in the, yeah, the, in the more you can get your play out there, great. There was a hand up over here? Yeah. Well, you were saying we could query topics or themes, yeah. and I just thought we might take advantage, like, after bullying, are there any a couple other things that people are looking for? Oh, what's right now? Or, yeah, what do you have a sense of like what, what people are hungry for? We have one that's kind of fun. Um, that uh, it's a stage combat collection, um, and it's by the writer. You know, uh, I'm having a brain fart. It's early. It's Jeff Cole, I think, but he did a um, like Seven Santas, and so we also have a bunch of themes that are like naughty Christmas books. Um, <laughs> eight reindeer monologues, which could stand all over. And then, um, uh, actually, Matt Hoverman, who was here last year, had his Christmas shorts, um, which we've seen kind of a spike in that. And then he just went to Andy, which is crazy. <laughs> um, on the side. But yeah, so um, I, uh, holiday collections are always kind of fun. Um, there's a lot of them, so just be aware of that. I would also like, um, I didn't say this earlier, but Google the publisher, do your research before you submit. Yes. Uh, if you send us a collection of shorts to me that are holiday themes, I'll probably come back to you and say, well, we have like four other ones. I don't know if this is the right place. And that's as much about it being an advantageous relationship for both of us. I don't want to take your play if I don't think it's going to uh, it's going to compete like because stuff, that's really an injustice to you. And I don't want you to be like, well, why did my play do well? OK, well, you're And the playwright who wrote the other one that you have. So why did you take them? Yeah. I, I, I just, I'll throw out some themes. <laughs> Good writing. Um, so, uh, I think I'm always, I would always, I'm always wondering why no one ever does like a 10 minute little short, tiny, funny riffs on classics. Like I feel like a collection of that. A teacher oh, would Chris go crazy. Yeah, 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 like a teacher would go crazy over that. Think about what a teacher, we're really for 10 minute plays, thinking about universities, high schools, and community theaters. Um, we're thinking about professional theaters too. Sometimes they'll do that for a benefit. But think about what what are teachers teaching? So bully plays make sense because that it gets better. That's a really big movement right now. That's zero tolerance bullying policies. Like they're really that's really potent for schools right now. It's really important to them. Um, so yeah, like classics because then they can. The other thing is <laughs> this is a great sick. sample is Tom Stoppard's fifteen. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's really yep. Yeah. Yeah. The you know like. Schools now, because of all these crazy curriculum standards, no longer believe that a play is just literacy because it's a play. You have to like sell it, and it has to fit all these strands. So teachers are looking for things that they can claim as like English class. So you know what's ridiculous is, of course, we all here in this room know that any play is English class. But um, you know, so things like that are riffs on classic that are fun for the kids, but also educational in the traditional sense for an English class are really great. But make sure they're really classics, like that if there's an underlying rights issue. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. Public, public domain. domain. Public domain. Yeah, yeah. public Which domain. Which we'll talk about. We'll public talk domain. About. Yeah, make sure, yeah. Every, every mark is going right. to have its own, <laughs> its own special themes, obviously, you know, high schools, like bullying. Um, you know, I would think that colleges, there's been so many cases of like, sexual abuse going on, what we've been hearing out in the news on the, on the, on the college campuses these days. I would think that that might be an interesting theme. You know, community theaters are probably going to want lighter, lighter fare for the most part. You know, the high school ones, no, no foul language. You know, well, Lots of roles for women. That's Lots of roles really for women. Has to be more Colleges women. are always Colleges. looking for everywhere. Plays that have like girls. Plays that you, you know, like. 
high schools, they always ask, 15 you know, characters. can we cast the, the uh, police officer in, in yeah. our stick and old lace with a woman, you know, girl, yeah. so yeah. Senior theater would be another senior theater. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we have a bunch of things. Also, is a big issue. Yeah, we just published two. As an activist, I wonder about climate change because, uh, you know, like I never see a lot about that. I would love to see more about that. It's not light and funny necessarily, though it could be. Um, yes. City women's allows large casts. What cast size are appropriate as markets? For sure. Well, say for the, you know, for the school markets, for the large, 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 you're going to be able to involve a lot of people in that evening. So, yeah, sure. so not a large yeah. Yeah. two, three, four, max. Yeah, because yeah, you can't handle it. More than four is, is just as a writer, it's really hard to kind of like. Yeah, it's 10 minutes, two, hours to get it. Four, so. Where are we? But even there, with the 10 minute plays, I think I think that even there, if they have strong <coughs> female roles, it makes it more. I would say if you have a large cast show too, um, reading other plays, like I know Israel Horowitz, who is a great short play writer, I, we have a great collection that I didn't bring by Israel, but um, she, you can order it. Please go get me free shipping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, he has a play where people are all jogging in a marathon, and it's like eight people, and it's ten minutes, but it's fantastic. So I mean, read a lot of plays. Like find like I know we're all pushing our books, and it's kind of, but there's a reason for that. And the more you read, like you can see examples of where like oh, this does really work in this large cast, and like this is how, you know, like like look at the form too. Different types. Yes, and this one over there. John's first, and then John. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Actually, she's at her. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, I work at um, Books and Books, and I'm actually part of the children's department. I'm in charge of book buying. So I was just actually just intrigued on whether or not you pay attention to the literary trends, i.e. we had the vampire dystopian kind oh, of, yeah. like if the trends correspond to or correlate to what submissions you get in or what submissions you pay attention to. Now it's like what I call sick lit, which like the main character has cancer or they have, or they just figure, <laughs> there's something, yeah, false nurse stars, you pay attention to one of the trees, so they wonder the challenge is <laughs> so I don't know if, if that's corresponding, because I know you were talking about bullying, and I know what I had to do ordering this coming for this coming fall, I had like six or seven books all about bullying, either in the perspective of the bully or in the perspective of the person being bullied. So I just was wondering if everything kind of ties in with like literary media and with like... I, I, I say yes, that's my short answer. I think it's hard. I mean, playwrights... Uh, I don't know, because I, I mean, I think when everyone, when you sit down to write a play, you're not necessarily thinking about, okay, what trend am I trying to, I mean, there are publishers here that aren't represented, that are more tied into those, well, I mean, you, you guys publish a lot of children's literature, dramatic, or not children's literature, but like, do you have the giver, or you have the, um, and I think actually TYA, yeah, the Minneapolis Children's Theater and Seattle Children's Theater actually, um, when they commission work, they retain the licensing rights. And they have a whole slew of stuff that's specifically for young audiences. Called PYA, a place for young audiences. Yeah, yeah. And they may actually be more um, on those trends. I think because. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I couldn't. But I will say that um, we, we often look for work for. We do a lot of one act competition plays for high schools. And yes, we're very much clicked into what high school kids are watching outside of their theater classes, like Divergent and The Fault in Our Stars. And, you know, obviously we're, we're not able, because of rights issues, to get those exact things, but we're often looking for things that we know kids will gravitate to because it's what's in the ether right now. So I would say for the school market, that's very true, and those things speak to each other. So how has the self-publishing trend affected your industry? Because we've seen some plays brought into I published this on Amazon, you can buy it right now. And, and they've never been produced. Yeah. So, and probably won't. How is that? Publishing and licensing are really different. So, if somebody self publishes something, 
that player. So it doesn't, and sometimes I've, we found a beautiful thing, maybe a handful in our um, the past few years where that's happened. So it doesn't, it's, it's fine, it doesn't hurt us. It's, I would say the same, yeah. but again, I would say that's probably the, the case of, of somebody who's just written it and wants it published and thinks that publishing is, yeah. is a first step rather than a last step. Right. Um, or, that, or that by having it in book form, it, it's going to be. I will say, though, yeah. um, there's actually several short play writers that I interact with who've gotten, because um, you know, the short play model is not necessarily, you're not going to get rich from writing short plays. I think that's something that everyone, I mean, with the, there's maybe a few exceptions of people that have made a really substantial career out of it. But, um, so, you know, I, I think French has really scaled back overall on the amount of short plays we publish. And I've had some writers, we have a lot of writers in the French catalog. And I know there's like several in the room, so maybe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like Robert Paisley, who was here last year, had sent me a collection of great short plays. Uh, that I was like, yeah, you know, it's, it's hard for us. We have a lot. We just published a lot of books and short plays recently. I think they'll compete. Um, he actually published his own collection and has been licensing them himself over via his agent. And it's like quite well with it. Um, but he just wanted the book in hand to, to give to people. I'm trying to think if someone else did that too recently where they, oh, like Indie Theater Now. Um, there's that yeah, model. Yeah, Martin Denton, who used to run NewYorkTheater.com, started an uh, online platform called Indie Theater now, which is a totally a digital publishing platform, and he ends up taking a lot of yeah. ten minute. I know he cover, uh, published Matt Freeman's uh, ten minute plays via there, which I also unfortunately could not publish. Um, so yeah, so there are other options, and I'd say that indie theater now is a little different than self publishing because I think Martin's actually asking people. And it's, it's curated. It's curated. It's curated. It's curated. It's curated. It's curated. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Um, so out of, uh, you know, a lot of these 10 minute submissions sometimes have like 1,400, you know, submissions. So like, what advice would you give in terms of how to make your play jump out of the stack? That's it. Uh, like, really <laughs> 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 one's advice yeah. is, uh, you know, we see, there's like, things that are in the cultural, like, DNA, and we see, yes. we'll see, like, ten plays that are all set in a bar. Like, we divide up the submissions into packets of 20, and in a packet of 20, four pl plays can be set in a bar, four plays can be on a park bench, four plays will be at a bus stop, and, like, three are breakup plays. And then you have, like, two plays out of that packet that, that are take place in a supermarket, or take place in, like, it's the end of the world, and so many, you know, and those are, like, a little more... So, so, I mean, really, if you're writing in a traditional setting and you have a short play, really the idea has to be super original in that setting because you have to know that there's, there's so many other plays that also happen. And in the end, I was just actually talking about that with you, is that like, for our competition, it does come down a bit to programming. Um, and I think a lot of these festivals, you have to have variety. You have to have things that are yeah. a little off the wall. You can't have, you know, we have 30 plays. We can't have five of them set in a bar, I mean, it'd be easy for Casey because then the set would be the same, but, you know, for the audience, it would be a little tiring. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the box. the ones this year, I've talked to some people about the programming this year because it is such a weird festival, like the ones that really rose to the reading process. We have a play where they, like, these two girls kill a baby on stage. I'm like, oh, so it, it works in the context of the play. We'll see if it works on stage. We have... Um, you know, a play that's a Japanese robot play that's you know, Winkler's, that's really crazy. So plays that have really taken some big, big risks, um, and they seem to, to land a lot better. So I'd say, you know, use it to try out your most adventurous idea. And it's I love what John Jury was talking about, like to push out of the realism box, you know, and I wonder because in, in you know, the full length play that's not necessarily, you know, I wish you would explain that. But, you know, is that more possible in, in the short form? I can. Yeah. That, yeah. That, yeah, you can do anything in the short form, you know. I, I, when I put my books, I try to put a wide variety of different things, you know. I might put a traditional realistic play right next to it, one that has a device, like one of the things that Mr. George spoke about is something that really couldn't be done anywhere else that could only sustain. And I, I'll give you two examples. It's one was I put, put a, a just Australian children play, right, a very successful. Send me this play, and I put it in one of my 10 minute play collections. It was called Esla and Friends Go Partying. 
<laughs> and the characters were two helium-filled balloons at a children's birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> and, then and then another one that I, I'm doing a collection for applause, which is being prepared for publication, that's uh, placement specifically for teens. And there was one I found in that, that uh, and it was called Candy Likes Your Status. And it's provided entirely on Facebook uh, exchange. And um, it's hilarious. And, and so I, I, there's a guy in England named Nick Bryce who, who does a festival every year. And he takes them to the Edinburgh Festival. Edinburgh, Edinburgh Festival. And uh, I sent that to him with a couple other ones. And he's going he's gonna to do that at the Edinburgh Festival. He sent me actually pictures of it from their production in London. And it was these girls one. It was very funny. So I think that those devices, you know, that, that I particularly enjoy those kinds of things. That's I kind of think that, that the most successful 10-minute plays are almost never, or the most produced at any rate, not that successful, depends on how you define that, yeah, but yeah. I mean like the most produced one short plays that we have are, are you know, David Ives, Chris Durang, people who are not necessarily known for realism. Um, <laughs> you know, so it seems to me that the 10-minute form, the short play form, is is almost built or more geared towards uh, that because of the heightened nature, because they're so compressed. Yeah. I mean, again, when I talk about workshops of writing short plays, I kind of, again, focusing on the word play. So think of it as a full-length play compressed down to 10 minutes. And so everything needs to be heightened and under pressure in a, in a, in right. a different weird way. Or at least when I write my own, they're certainly, like, yeah. they're certainly more absurd than, than the ten minute play is not a scene from a large play. Yeah, I just want to say too, just real quick. I think I, it's not just the content is is also non realistic. It's also form. Like you can also play with form and style. So you can't have a place that in the bar. But like, like I thought what Steve Yockey did with the chorus last night and that convention of the chorus was such an interesting way to tell to add something to the story that was really fundamentally, you know, about differences in couples. But it was this weird like. I think we have to wrap up, but did well, you just want one to say thing that, yeah. well, One thing that might be useful uh, both to the writers and to you folks in terms of a need from the field. Um, I, I teach at the university mm -hmm. level and I've taught on both graduate and undergraduate level. We use a lot of 10-minute plays in the classroom uh, as a semester project or as a team. And what we can't find are there are very few plays available to us that are two women, which yes. we need. I mean, we use a few. Uh, and secondly, we need plays which are indeterminate, two character plays which are indeterminate in terms of sex, so that it can be cast with two men, one woman, one man, two women, to use in the classroom, because you never know what the class composition is, do you know what I mean? And those two areas are really wide open. I always include in my books exactly what, at least two or three examples of exactly what it is. When I put in there, it could be, if you in the title of the contact, it's like this has three men, one woman. Well, if you can contact the field, because I'm out there and I don't know how to find them. You jumped around, John. Here's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one title, Exhibit This, by um, Luigi Genuzzi, uh, which is like, I, I love to tell my high school and college, because it's, it's set, it's like short scenes set in a museum, but it's 26 men or 26 women or six, like it's like 25 different scenes and it's so interchangeable and the set is just like a room, you know, like in like a, so like that kind of thing, I really recommend reading something like that because he does a great job of. He also has a All the King's Women, which is about women obsessed with Elvis, it's like 26 <laughs> and, and the other market, by the way, just told you that I've been amazed by uh, because I'm a Jane Austen adapter, is I would say fully 30% of the productions I get are from Christian schools That's who are looking for material yeah. within their life view, which does not necessarily inhibit you if that is not your life view. I mean, Jane Austen is fine, right? You can have good but there's a big Christian market out there. He actually published Tim by Tim, which had a different name. Um, and this was based upon, it was another commission given to ten of our playwrights to write a play, a ten-minute play, based upon one of the Ten Commandments. Wow, wow. Which they just had to draw randomly. They didn't choose their own. Okay.
But in that market, in that market, you're actually safer not doing biblical material because of differences in theological view. You're actually better simply writing plays that do not hit the hot deep. spots yeah. that they're not doing. These are not secular yeah. or religious yeah. markets. That's yeah. why we renamed it um, a 10 short plays which means about ethics and values. That's <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like modern morality. Um, so do we have to wrap up? We do because Michael Dixon's here. Oh, and well, <laughs> it's going to be a continuation of the discussion yes. with, uh, with the publishers. Down in the publishing. <laughs>